fourth member here, but we're going to get started. So we have Nora Lesserson, um, Gokul Ramadas, and Sarah Shrek here with us today. So they're going to go in that order. They're going to tell us a little bit about how they got where they are, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. Oh, looks okay. like Jackie's here as well. Okay, awesome. So yes, welcome. Okay, so we will have uh, four mentors for you here today. Um, so again, just gonna just gonna go in order. So we'll have Nora, then Gokul, then Sarah, and then Chiaki. Just tell us a bit about how they got where they are, and then we'll open it up for questions for you all. Great. Okay. So my name's Nora. I'm a PhD candidate in history at University College London. Um, I previously did my master's in Middle Eastern studies at Harvard and my undergrad at Harvard in the study of religion. And so something I always like to talk about is that I didn't actually understand academia or even what it meant to kind of study and write history until basically the end of college. So I got through all of college not even knowing what these, these things really meant. And the way I got into it was through family history. So I grew up knowing I was Armenian. I knew my mother was Armenian. I knew what it meant to have an Armenian last name, like the Kardashians. I knew that we ate some Armenian foods. I knew that my grandparents uh, spoke Armenian. But I really had no sense of what it meant until um, sort of the end, of, sort of my mid, my early twenties, and I always assumed that I was Armenian, and that meant I was from the Republic of Armenia, or my mother's family was from the Republic of Armenia that you see on the map because I love maps, and you know you see it on the map. And then someone asked me at the end of college, like, "Oh, you're Armenian, you know." from where? Armenian from where? And I didn't know what that question meant. I just assumed it meant the nation state of Armenia. And so that, that's what I said. But then I said, okay, let me actually ask my grandparents, like, where are your parents from? And they gave me the names of these towns and cities. And when I looked them up in Google, uh, they, they, these were in Turkey. And I thought, oh, am, am I Turkish? Like, I don't, I don't know what this means. And so <laughs> I kind of had to figure out what it meant that there's, and they kept saying, you know, we're from Armenia. And I'm looking at the map and I'm like, that's Turkey. <laughs> and so I had to figure out what does it mean that they're calling this place Armenia, that the map says it's Turkey, that this is not the nation state of Armenia that's on the map. And so I had a lot of questions. And so those very, very personal questions, I realized were actually historical questions, right? And so when I tried to learn about why this was the case, particularly at the time, this was now about 2011, so 10 years ago, um, there wasn't the best history writing about this. The best history writing I could find turned out to be my own great grandfather and he wrote a memoir. And so I learned through my great grandfather's memoir about his life in what's now Turkey. And there was a genocide, the Armenian genocide that caused him and his family to leave Turkey uh, to spend some time in what's now Syria and eventually to move on to the United States. And I was so educated by his text and I wanted to find texts that could tell me more about what my great grandfather was speaking about. And it was hard because there was a lot of trauma on the Armenian side. There was a lot of uh, defense on the Turkish side. This wasn't a genocide. Um, and the Armenians kind of didn't want to then associate with Turkey and so then they weren't telling sort of complete stories. So I started writing history. I started doing history professionally, um, trying to answer just my own family questions, how to make sense of my own great grandfather's text. And it's led to this sort of wonderful sort of career now in which I'm constantly trying to tell more complicated stories about Armenians who lived in what's now Turkey and the lives they lived before the genocide, before sort of their identities for various reasons became stripped from things that were associated with Turkey. And so I guess the message here is that you never know where professional, where academic, where research interests will stem from. I had no idea when I was learning, when I was asking my grandparents that this would become sort of a professional endeavor, but it certainly motivates me every day to, to keep going and to keep doing my history work. So that's my story. Thanks for sharing with us, Nora. It's really interesting how much of a personal connection you have with your work as well. Yeah. Um, appreciate you sharing that with us. 
Um, so if anyone has questions for Nora, we're gonna we're gonna take them at the end. Um, and so we're gonna move on to Gokul now. Hi, I'm Gokul. I'm a PhD candidate in biomedical science at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF. Um, but how I got there, I guess, is pretty. Uh, it's a pretty good example of some advice that I've gotten from people, which is that when you're thinking about where your career might end up and you're trying to plan, it's you don't need to think of it as like a straight line, like I want this career, so I'm going to do this. It's more like a series of steps of just doing the next best thing for you or the thing that you're most interested in at the time that will take you on a path to end up to end up where you are. Um, so when I was in high school, I was thinking, you know, what do I want to do in college? Because you know, I need to decide my college major so I can decide my job and what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Uh, and my dad happened to know someone who uh, worked in computer science and I think had a like a very small startup, like some computer science, some hardware, some stuff. And he was like, you, you can just try this out. It's a good career. Um, and I tried it out. I did it like a, an unpaid internship sort of thing at their at their company. And uh, for me, I just I didn't end up liking the lifestyle. Like I didn't like the kind of work that, or the, the kind of work style, it just wasn't suited for me. Uh, granted, if I, if it was for me, maybe I'd be making a lot more money than I am right now. But uh, at the time I just decided it wasn't for me. And that's okay, that's a very useful thing to come out of your internship is knowing that you, you can rule out that career for you. Maybe you didn't like that one. I had similar things where I was like thinking about would I wanna be a doctor? And for me, I didn't think I would, I would do well in med school or do well as a doctor. So sort of like by process of elimination, I was able to, to rule out a few options. But then one thing that helped a lot was I did the summer program uh, at Stanford actually was like it, it exposed you to engineering careers, for example. And the one that I really liked there was uh, environmental engineering. So this was like junior year of high school, I think. Uh, and then so I applied to colleges thinking I'm going to be an environmental engineer. I want to help save the planet, come up with like new energy sources and things like that. Uh, so I ended up going to Berkeley for undergrad uh, because they had a good like chemical engineering program and I thought that's pretty close to environmental engineering. Uh, and in my first year of chemical engineering classes, they, were, they require us to take a seminar in something that's not chemical engineering or just it's, that's not like the particular engineering that you're doing. And I took a class called careers in biotechnology. And then in that class, I learned about stem cells and how stem cells can be used to uh, treat different, um, different like uncured diseases at the moment, like spinal cord uh, injuries and stuff like that. And that class was just so mind opening to me that I literally was like sitting up all night thinking, you know, I could probably do see myself doing this for a career. So then I applied to labs at Berkeley to try to get involved in research as an undergrad. I ended up working in a lab that did stem cell research, among other things, uh, working in the brain. Um, and then while in that lab, I was exposed to not only using stem cells, but also gene editing technology and stuff like that. So, uh, so that also set me on another path. And now in my PhD, I'm actually studying gene editing technology. I'm using stem cells as a tool to study them, but I'm actually studying uh, how to do therapeutic gene editing to treat uh, diseases that affect the brain. So at each of those steps, I was making the decision that I thought was like, the, the best decision for me at the time, but where I ended up being is not what I would have foreseen in high school at the time. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing with us. I think that's an important uh, thing to take home is that you know you don't have to have everything figured out right now. Um, so finding things that you're excited about, it sounds like, and keeping an open mind was really important for you. Um, so thanks for sharing. Yeah, so Sarah, uh, you are up next. Awesome, thank you. And I'm going to, I think, repeat a bit of the sentiment that you just shared, Gokul. Um, I am currently in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I work at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council as their communication specialist. I'm a recent graduate of Carnegie Mellon University's Master of Arts Management program. Um, so Master of Arts Management is kind of where you'll, you'll find this kind of bimodal history that led to where I am now. I always loved the arts. I was very involved with theater as a child. Still am today, hopefully, as much as I can be. Um, but I really wanted to pursue arts and culture in a way that was financially viable, like anyone in the arts would love to do. But also in a way that sort of built on um, academic knowledge in some way. So when I was in high school looking at colleges, I had to make a difficult decision between um, a place of what I think would be higher prestige, at least in my family, um, versus a place that I knew I could explore those different interests to find the right path to pursue what I wanted to do in a way that made sense for me. Um, so in the end, I wound up uh, double majoring and double minoring because I was still sort of finding my path, even in college. I knew I wanted to go to grad school and that I would be able to focus 
even more um, on a, a secondary degree in that way. Um, so in, in the theme of this panel of, of how I got to where I am, I want to like just throw in a few little key examples of, of things that led to where I am now on my path. Um, finding ways to integrate my academic research with real world application. For example, in undergrad, I did an undergraduate thesis um, all about public relations. So one of my majors was advertising and public relations, hopefully the way to make the arts something that could be um, sort of something I could go to sleep knowing I will have a job <laughs> next month, um, but also a very engaging and exciting field. So I decided to study public relations as part of this undergraduate thesis. While doing that project, I made sure to reach out to local theaters, um, especially the large ones in my area based on where my college was, um, and use uh, any resources I could through them. For example, using their um, email lists to do survey-based research with their patrons. In the end, this served me really well because I got to expand sort of the undergraduate uh, research stuff <laughs> at my institution. And I was able to give my results to those theaters that then would ask me to work for them in the future. Um, so if there's one little nugget I would love to impart on everyone attending today, it's that if you can find a real world application, if that serves what your goals are with your learning and your working, if you can put those together, it served me very, very well. <laughs> And, and sort of an, an extra nugget to sort of tie into there. Um, I was very lucky to be in classes with really awesome professors who did really cool personal projects. So if you find a way to get involved in their classes or in projects that are sort of tangential to what you're studying, you'll find yourself in really unexpected places. Um, I just volunteered to help out with extra tutoring in my astronomy class very early on. And a few years later, that astronomy professor, I, I have nothing to do with astronomy, but with marketing and stuff, he wanted my assistance with something. I wound up being a VIP member of a NASA launch that I, <laughs> I was not qualified to, to, to call myself a VIP yet. Um, but that expanded sort of my knowledge. And I actually do pull in lessons from that in the work I do now. So those, that's like kind of my history and kind of some nuggets of wisdom uh, thrown in there. So that's that. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. I think definitely always keeping an open mind for opportunities and making sure you take advantage of them and, you know, continuing to connect with people is great. So thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, last but not least, we have Chiaki. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chiaki Santiago. I'm currently a third year PhD student at uh, UC San Diego, and I'm studying, uh, I'm in a neurosciences degree. So my path is a little bit, um, I, I was trying to figure out a way to describe it. And I think the probably best way to is that my life is full of fantastic accidents. And it's guided a lot by really amazing mentors that have allowed my curiosity to kind of be um, fostered and then allowing that creativity just to keep going. So when I was in high school, I, my parents, I didn't really have like parents that had gone to college and none of the students that came out of my high school actually went to college. And so I didn't have a lot of examples as to like how to get in, but I was always told from a really young age, like, okay, like if you go to college, then you'll be able to get a job. You'll be able to sustain yourself. Like you need to be able to find that path that way. And thankfully I had amazing high school counselors that I just went to their door almost every other day and asked questions about, you know, what is college? What are these processes? And I realized that asking questions was probably the biggest tool and the biggest asset that I had, because once you do that, people are more than willing to, to answer and be your guide. And so I thankfully like talked with my high school counselor and I tried to keep on my grades and I was able to go to Vanderbilt. So I went to Vanderbilt University down in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was trying to, um, very similar to Gokul, figure out a way to find what I'm interested in. And I realized that, you know, I took one AP psychology class in high school and I was super interested in this integration of psychology and behavior, which I think lends itself to trying to understand neurobiology and neuroscience itself. I took a couple classes and I remember sitting in my first seminar in, in just college and I was like, oh my gosh, this is very scary. And you're <laughs> in like a huge like auditorium and you're in front of a professor. But then I realized that again, I fell back on using these questions and using that curiosity to drive what I wanted to know about neuroscience and what I wanted to know about the brain. And then, you know, another fantastic accident happened where I stumbled on this uh, research symposium that Vanderbilt was hosting. And I was able to talk to a postdoc that worked in this drug discovery center that's also a center like lab 
And I was able to get a research position there and in his lab and study um, neuropsychiatric disorders. So I spent my senior thesis working on um, understanding how different drugs, uh, different drugs could be used for the treatment of major de depressive disorder. And I spent two and a half years just like finding fellowships and connecting and talking with other people, again, still asking questions on how I can expand my knowledge of neuroscience. And as I you know, went to different conferences and different symposia, I was able to even present my own research and kind of build up my knowledge of this field. And then from there, it kind of lent itself that like, I really love this research process in academia in general, and how can I continue that path? And from there, I decided to then apply to UC San Diego for neurosciences. And it's just been a wonderful journey ever since. I um, currently study, um, still study the brain, obviously, but I study, you know, more of like a fine tuned genetic uh, area. And it's been something that I realized, like looking back is that you should always be asking questions and you should always be okay and never feel like your questions are stupid because you are allowed to be in the room and you are allowed to take space and say things that, you know, just ask questions of your curiosity because we're all starting from places that are different. I definitely didn't start from a place of knowing anything. Like, I, again, I like didn't have people to kind of go off of in terms of finding a career, but then as you ask questions and you keep going, you kind of stumble and find these really great things that you're motivated about. So that's kind of my journey. I think that's really uh, wise wisdom to impart. And I also think that that's something that we all as, as mentors try to make very clear as well to our students that, you know, we want you to ask questions. We want you to be engaged, you know, we, we also in our own lives are always trying to ask questions and learn more. So um, that actually segues really nicely too because we have a question section now. Um, so you can feel free to ask our panelists um, anything that you're wondering after their talks, um, anything about their work, really anything that you, uh, you, know, you wanna pick their brains about. So you can feel free to request um, to share your video and audio and I can put you up on the screen. You can ask your question or you can write in the Q and A session, um, section, excuse me, section for our session. And we actually already have one question here. Um, Oasis wants to know what the toughest part of mentoring virtually is for everyone. So you can start answering that and I will field some other questions that are coming in. So anybody who's watching, feel free to request audio video or ask your question in the chat. I can start. I realize that my um, mentoring ability comes from my ability to have genuine conversation back and forth. And with Zoom, there is this hard part where you're talking and then all of a sudden somebody else wants to talk. There's this, naturally there's an overlap of language that happens where if I'm having a conversation with somebody, they're laughing or maybe they're trying to start a new sentence that you kind of can't capture in Zoom. It's like one audio picks up in the other and you're like, what did you just say? Like, <laughs> Can you read? And I think it makes, Heart, mentoring harder because I want, I don't want the mentee to feel as if they need to have one stream of consciousness that they're constantly trying to get in edgewise. Like I want there to be like a back and forth between both of us. And it's been hard to try to allow that back and forth to happen. So sometimes if there's a talk that's happening or if we're going back and forth and they have like a single thought and they don't want it to escape from their brain while I'm talking, they kind of just put it in the chat and try other ways to make sure that that thought is communicated. I totally agree. I think one of the hardest parts is that, that awkward silence that almost has to be part of your conversations because, you know, whether it's laggy internet or something, you have to wait a little bit longer to make sure that they're about to say something. Um, but I think, I think part of it as mentors, part of it is like, you're supposed to give that sort of space anyway, so that, you know, people who are even shyer as a mentee might still feel a little more comfortable filling that space by by talking and things like that. And I think it's important to note that there are also a lot of benefits to virtual mentoring. For example, the, men the mentee I have right now, I would not have been able to, to mentor if it was in person. This is someone who lives on the other side of the planet, uh, but we're able to be connected through this. And um, yeah, I think, I think it opens up a lot of doors uh, as well. So it's, a, it's definitely a different style of communication than I'm used to, but it's, it's not all bad. <laughs> I'd love to echo that because I feel like every every drawback that we every tough part has like it's an equal like equivalent of of positivity. Like for example, it's really easy to reschedule if something comes up for either us or our mentees, but it's also really easy to reschedule. And you may reschedule and reschedule and reschedule and reschedule. 
et cetera, <laughs> um, as well as being able to reach somebody so far away, but also have to coordinate times in that way. So I think something that I want to um, tackle the most, that's sort of the tough part of mentoring virtually is so that the um, mentee doesn't feel like they have to perform for me. If, you know, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it can be a lot more casual, but something about the like seeing yourself in second person in some way, somewhat, um, and watching yourself pr maybe present what you were working on, I think it adds more pressure than, than normally um, than you would face-to-face. -face. So trying to make sure that the, the mentee feels very conversational um, is my goal, at least. I agree with everybody. <laughs> Great points. Fair enough. All right, so we're still waiting for some questions to come in. So if anybody wants to share their audio or video, feel free to do that or write them in the um, question and answer uh, section. Um, in the meantime, I actually have a question for you guys. So I was, you know, it's really interesting for me to hear about all of your stories and your path. And, you know, it's really impressive, I think, what you're all doing right now. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I think most of our students are in high school or at the very beginning of college. So can you talk a little bit about how you felt at that time, sort of about your career. I know, um, you know, Gokul, you talked about that a little bit, but, you know, was it always very clear to you what you wanted to do? Did you feel like you were going to be able to get there or was it, you know, a little bit stressful for you at times just to sort of give our students a sense of how you were feeling in their position? Okay, yeah, so I definitely didn't know. I think I didn't have a sense of professionalization until the end of school, and I was graduating right into the 2008-9 recession, so then there weren't really jobs, so I didn't even know what it meant to see a job listing. Um, but I found that was the case with many students, at least in my generation. I think there's maybe a little bit more pre-professionalization these days, so I'm not sure if it's the same. Um, but I found that finding the right people has served me well no matter what. Just developing relationships, people who you even just have an instinctual drawing to, they're the ones who are gonna ask the questions that get you where you need to go. And I think we've all kind of spoken about how you don't necessarily even expect to go where you're gonna go. And I think that's the biggest lesson I wish, you know, had been drummed into my head even more. You're not gonna know where you're going. Um, but almost just follow your intuition and your people and they get you where you need to go. I would definitely say, don't be afraid to recognize that you don't enjoy something anymore, that you don't want to pursue something anymore. It can be terrifying. When I went into college, I was like, all right, no more theater. We're done with that. We're going to put that in the little charger box in the closet and that's just going to stay there. Um, and we're going to pursue something uh, different, a lot more structured. And I did, and I'm still doing that work. Um, but the things you love will always sneak back up on you and in a positive way too. At the same time, there are folks who I know who have switched many things. I think Gokul mentioned this earlier of having an internship is like part of having an internship is discovering that it's not what you want. Um, so it can be really scary when that happens. Don't be afraid to jump in, try new things early um, as sort of a trial, trial period, so. Yeah, and I think just to echo again that it is a scary decision or a scary feeling to think like, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life, but the decision you're making right now is not deciding what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It's just making the best decision for right now. And like I said, I made I made many, many best decisions right now that took me in completely different, not completely different directions, but like it wasn't, it wasn't a straight line. It was like a very curvy line to get there. And I'm very happy with each of those decisions. And I wasn't making those decisions thinking, okay, how am I going to get to this biomedical science PhD at the end of this, right? I was thinking, what is, what am I most interested in right now? What can I uh, get excited to do when I wake up tomorrow, right? That was basically what I was asking myself at each point. And then my interests evolved, and so my answer evolved, right? But uh, you're just, you're, you're not making your the best decision right now for the rest of your life. You're making the best decision for right now. Definitely, and like I, I mean, just to reiterate i definitely didn't know what i was doing in in high school and in the beginning of college i i knew that i really enjoyed science and there that was just like a something that was like natural and i i wanted to pursue it even more but 
it's okay to not know what you want to do and it's okay to figure it out along the way because no matter what you're going to have new experiences it's i think it's easy to feel in that age like definitely when i was in high school i felt like oh my gosh it's like if i can't figure out what i'm going to do this is the end and like i'm not going to be able to know what i'm going to do here on out and that's not the case at all you're allowed to explore you're allowed to to do things that drive your curiosity um so that you can pursue something so it's okay to not know what you want to do. And if you want to sample, like, I mean, you, you can sample at any stage in your life as well, right? Like I know that I loved neuroscience, but then even getting into grad school, we do these like graduate rotations where we go and sample different labs to figure out where do we want to spend our thesis. And I primarily worked in mice. And then I was like, oh, you know, why don't I just work in worms? And like, I tried that and you try different model organisms and stuff like that. And it opens and expands your mind. So you can take that same curiosity and, and keep sampling throughout your life. It doesn't have to be one thing that you do uh, for the rest. So It's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we do have a question in the chat to end our session. So the question is, do you feel there is a need to understand the mentee's mind and understand his or her goal before mentoring? Will it help in a better result later? So if each of you want to give us a quick answer, we can... Uh, we can finish up with that question. I think it's important to know the mentee's goal, but not necessarily understand the mentee or like read the mentee's mind. I think um, it's good to flush out what your expectations are and what you're trying to get out of the experience as a mentee. And if you have a goal in mind, that's even like, I want to write an abstract that goes to a conference or I want to write like some sort of, or have some sort of finished product that I want, they, these goals can be really based off of the individual. And I think that really helps in a better result because then if I know your goal, I know what to expect and I know like how to drive your goal and how to get you there. Um, so I think it, it's not necessary to understand your mind. I think that's a very complicated thing coming from a neuroscientist, but <laughs> understanding your goal, goal is definitely very important. Yeah, totally. I think in, in my mentorship meetings, like what I like to emphasize, what aspect of the of the process I like to emphasize depends on what the student wants to get out of it. Like, are you interested in learning what it's like to be like a scientist, right? In that case, we probably spend a lot more of our meetings doing the brainstorming or reading the literature together, for example, reading a paper together and talking about how, like what are, what are the pros and cons of this? What are the weaknesses? Whereas if your if your goal is just to get a taste for what it's like and maybe put a product out there and see what it see if you like the process and maybe I'll leave more of the the reading to you and then we'll just talk about what what your findings are right so I think my mentorship meetings look very different depending on what the what the mentee indicates to me they would want to <laughs> they they want to do in life I guess uh, or not in life but <laughs> what they want to get out of this mentorship. I will say that if a student somehow knows their preferred learning style or anything like that, that might give us a hint or tip for, for um, connecting with them in the way that they want. If they happen to know that, that's great to know. Um, goals, yes, but I, I agree with what's been said. Um, beyond that, it's fun to discover that as well in, in sessions together. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I do think that just because someone has a goal, whether it's at the late high school or early college stage or later on, doesn't mean it's not worth interrogating because sometimes something hasn't occurred to them or you don't always know what all the available options are. You're developing your imagination of what's possible. So goals are definitely a starting point and helpful, but sometimes it's good to think of what else one can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys for your time. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. And thank you to everybody uh, who was here listening and who asked questions. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the symposium. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Nice meeting you all. Nice to meet you. <laughs>